Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with Heather Christie from Moon Babe Records. And we are going to have an interesting conversation today about whether you should release your album EP single as an independent, or if you should look for an indie label or some label to support you. And I know this was a big question that I had when I first started, I was like, I thought, especially back then, you know, I thought I needed a label in order to release. And of course we all know now that that's not necessary, but there may be some serious benefits. So we're going to talk about the pros and cons and Before we get into that, though, I want to talk about her journey and how she got to the point where she did start an indie label, why she did that um, and all that. But first of all, Heather, what is your background in music and how um, how did you come up as an indie artist? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Brie. It's really exciting to be chatting today. And I started when I was five in musical theater and wanting to be on Broadway. So that was my, my basic training was musical theater, voice, choir, jazz choir, all of that. So I started as a vocalist and a performer. And then by the time I hit college, I was like, I don't want to be in musical theater. What's this modern dance thing and philosophy and spirituality. So then I, you know, traveled to India and got a whole different perspective on the world. And that's when I started music production, because I found that learning how to produce my own music gave me the tools and the power to really create the kind of art and sounds that I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been my journey for the past 10 years or so is really in the music production and creating my own sonic brand and touring with that. So um, that's a very quick rundown, but (laughs) were, were you touring as an artist under your own name at that point? No. So when I first started, I actually did start as Heather Christie when I was like 21 and had gotten back from travels, but then I formed a band called Feral Fauna. So I was touring under that name for a few years. And then I started a band called Sirens of Soul. And then I started another band called Silk Drop. So I'm pretty much, I've been a collaborator a lot. Um, And so it, it hasn't been until a little later that I really claimed my own name and started using that for my primary project. Okay. And so when did you start um, your Moon Babe Records? So the idea for Moon Babe Records came within the past two years. Um, and it's kind of crazy. I just realized this, but I, I've been, and we can get more into this, you know, as we talk, but I've been wanting an alternative option to what I've been presented with as an independent artist. And it hasn't been out there for me that I've seen. There's been a lot of kind of black and white structures in ways that I don't necessarily feel good about saying yes to. Um, So I've been like, okay, well, uh, where do I go? What's the right label for me? And then about a year ago, I had this, the idea sort of start to bubble up. And then I was just looking back through my phone And the first time I came up with the idea of the name for Moon Babe Records was when I first got pregnant and I didn't know that I was pregnant yet, but the idea for the label has kind of synonymously grown with my pregnancy and transition into being a mom. So that's really, really cool. So I definitely want to get into that in a minute and like why you're focused on moms and that, which I think is awesome because I started my music, my music career in earnest as a mom. So I totally uh, jive with that, mm-hmm. but I wanted to know, like, what, what were you looking at out there and saying like mm-hmm. these structures don't really jive with me as far as yeah. when you said black and white and stuff, what did you mean by that? 
So what I saw was, first of all, when I was on American Idol in 2016, kind of by accident, I got to the top 200 uh, contestants because my friend was like, here, you should do this. I, I have the producer's email. Why don't you audition? And I was like, okay. So I did American Idol and it was a really big hit of like what I don't want essentially, which was this whole, you know, I mean, obviously, um, just like major industry, right? Around the music industry. And these, was like, this the one during the pandemic? No, this was 2016. Oh, 2016. Okay, got it. It was the last year that it was on, I forget what network, but they switched to networks. So it was like either ABC or NBC or something. Mm -hmm. And so I was in this whole crazy experience of like waking up at 4.45 in the morning, putting a bunch of makeup on and then like being cattle called with like hundreds of other singers. <laughs> into like the Dolby theater, you know, in Hollywood. And it's this whole show and this whole like clamoring for fame that they want you to feel and they want you to go for. And I realized that's not the kind of artist I am. <laughs> Maybe when I was five and I wanted to be on Broadway, like fame was my number one goal. But what that means to me has changed, right? First of all, the Latin root word of fame means to walk alongside your destiny. So that's more the kind of fame I'm talking about now. And, and then second of all, it was just this really like stripping you away from, from who you are as an artist and the process around who you are. You were supposed to just go perform your best show ever in 30 seconds and impress the judges and all the cameras. And I was like, I can't even do that. Like I need a warm up. I need to like, you know, I need to be mm -hmm. in my zone. Um, and it just felt really wrong to me and how they were pushing success and the ideas of success onto us and pushing us through this whole system that they had and kind of wanting to build out and carve out our artist identity for us, which to me is kind of the old way of the music industry, maybe yeah. how artists came up before and how the labels had control of their artist identity. And so for me, that experience shot me in the opposite direction. And I signed up for, I'm sure you know, of Rick Barker's program, The Music mm -hmm. Industry Blueprint. I did that. I signed up. I, you probably know Carrie Cole. And, I know all these people. You know, yeah. All these people. So I signed up for all of their programs and I was like, okay, how do I be an indiepreneur, a musicpreneur? So I studied all that for like five years. And then, you know, I started signing with these indie labels that were in my scene, kind of this I'm, you know, California West Coast. So it's kind of a festival, music festival scene, Burning Man-esque. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been signing with these indie labels that, you know, I won't necessarily say their names, but the way that they did the breakdown for the artist was like, okay, it didn't feel like that much better of an option than signing, than just releasing my music by myself, honestly. Right. Because they were either asking to own my master a hundred percent or split everything 50, 50 with me that I had already poured my heart, soul and money into. And then in exchange for putting my music on a few Spotify playlists. And that was the extent of the deal. Really? I, they weren't going to like do a big marketing push or well, then, yeah. Why, why would you even go with a label at that point? Exactly. But I could see a lot of indie artists such as myself going for these deals anyway, because it, you know, because we thought it might bring us further, right? We could mm -hmm. get further listens and plays and, and expand our audience. Well, and I know for me, when I was looking at it, I thought that having a label brought you prestige. Like I didn't mm -hmm. know any better. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's this idea that if you have an umbrella over you or some kind of, you're aligned with something bigger than yourself, then you're going to, yeah, be more presentable or something. And so, for me, I was just like, okay, well, obviously nobody knows what they're doing anymore. This is the wild, wild west of the music industry. So I started to slowly have this conception of, well, if, if these indie label structures don't work for me, what could work for me, you know, and what would work and what would actually feel supportive and artist centric and give me that added boost of, you know, what I think breaking it down further into is a sense of community and, and support and like someone who's got your back and is going to help you navigate things. Like if you've never worked with distribution options or album art, even just like everything that goes into a release, right. 
is having like some sense of team other like rather than just being totally by yourself in it. Yeah, I totally get that. I mean, I have a course called Rock Your Next Release and it's all about, you know, planning your your whole release journey because yeah. the artists don't have this support like you're saying. Exactly. Right? They don't have anyone to tell them, "Well, now you need to do this and now you need to do this and you need yes. to get these photos and you know, all of that." Mm -hmm. Um because it is overwhelming, especially for artists that don't like haven't been in the scene, they don't know like the jargon and the, you know, who are all the DSP. I mean, it's funny to see like the biggest stumbling block for a lot of artists is like, what DSP do I choose? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, or like what district, like, should I put it on all the DSPs or what distributor should I choose? Or, yeah. you know, should I like, I've heard of Spotify playlists, but how do I get on them? Like, you know, things that to me are not a big deal, but to them, it's like keeping them from moving forward. Totally. That's such a good point, Brie, because it's like these, yeah, like you said, the jargon and these building blocks that you just have to learn and understand can just feel super like in your way and overwhelming because you don't understand what they are or how you can even interact with them as, as an artist, uh, you know? So yeah, I think it's really important. So it sounds like to you, community was important. Is that why you decided to actually create a label instead of just, you know, going out there and, and producing or releasing your own music outside of someone else's label? Yeah, great question. So I think for me, the drive to start a label comes from my own process around my fear that becoming a mom will somehow outdate me or like negate my ability to be a successful artist mm. based on former societal beliefs or whatever around women and, and our artistry and how we have to be young and look a certain way or whatever in order to be successful. And so some of that still lives in my bones in, in some way, shape or form that I have to like work with or break down even, you know, to this day. And so for me to actually go out and create a label and a community that could um, speak directly to that and kind of go into that and help others find more confidence too. To me, that feels like, wow, what, why else would I even, you know, that's the best thing I can do is like in the process of breaking down my own fear and empowering myself how can I like, you know, bring that empowerment to others? Cause as you know, in the work you do, it's really about uplifting each other. And I think that's, uh, you know, kind of the feminine way more. Mm -hmm. So we, we work together. We're kind of, it's like this co-creative feminine energy rather than the singularity, like, uh, competitive energy, right. The maverick competitive energy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that doesn't actually get us as the farthest that we can go. So, yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And, and that's one of the reasons that I focus, uh, focus on building female centric communities is because when I was getting started, that was what pushed me forward is having a community like that of people that I could get inspired by and, and see what they're doing and emulate and all of that, instead of feeling like I was this Island and yes. trying to like figure it out on my own. Like, why couldn't I, you know, get together with this group of people and we could all move forward together? Yes, I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I love the mom angle because that was something, and that's something that people reach out to me a lot about because I have done videos about like being a mom and going on tour and stuff like that. Yes. And that was like, that is like a thing that makes people think, oh, my, you know, this is over now. I'm a mom. And I thought that for about, I always say like about five minutes, but it wasn't, it was about, <laughs> it was about five years, five minutes. <laughs> no, like it was the first, I think six weeks that I had my first child, I was like, okay, like this is my life now. I'm giving up that other stuff, that music pursuit, and I'm just focusing on this. And after about six weeks, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go crazy. Yeah. Like, I can't, I have to like explore this creative side. I have to be out there performing. I, yeah. I can't deny this part of me mm -hmm. and I won't be good for my kids if I'm like constantly 
putting that, you know, pushing that part down. Cause then I'm going to get this like mm. resentfulness and stuff. For sure. Thank you for speaking to that. <laughs> yeah. Do you get a lot of people, you know, coming to you saying, how can I even possibly consider a career now that I'm a mom? That's an interesting question. I haven't gotten a lot of that yet. Maybe I will just cause this is new. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have gotten more just like women thanking me mm. <laughs> for even holding this umbrella up and being like, Oh my God, I feel like there's finally a place for me, you mm -hmm. know? And it's more women who have been flirting with the idea of coming back into their music or something. And they are moms and they just haven't found that rhythm yet or that ability to fully do both or something and they're just like to even know that there's a place for me I like inspires me to work more on my music so thank you mm, and, that's and really even cool. just that is amazing yeah yeah and I think it really is with the new moms or the people that are about to become a mom that's a lot of times when people approach me because they're mm -hmm. like super scared that you yeah. know, now their life is going to be totally different and they have to give this up Right. And I think once people have been a mom for a while, they realize how they can integrate it back into their life. But it's that mm -hmm. I'm about to be a mom or I just became a mom. That's right. really stressful for them. Cause it's like this identity crisis. Totally completely. And just such a rite of passage, like mm -hmm. from maiden to mother, you know, and that's how it's been for me. And so it's been really empowering to weave my art into the whole process and kind of birth my label as I've birthed my daughter that's at so the same funny. time. <laughs> I love it. I love that. How that's, that's twins so, synergy yeah. is happening. Yes. <laughs> so how does your label support artists, you know, in traditional ways and then in untraditional ways? Great question. So some of the main aspects that artists do ask me about is like, PR, you know, what's the PR and um, what's the percentage? And so for me, I'm working with a distribution deal um, that comes through kind of one of the main major labels, uh, but it's called Six Degrees Records. And they we've signed a distribution deal to where basically they have this whole network of support with PR, uh, if artists want, as well as licensing pitching, which is also a huge question as we know. Yes. Um, <laughs> so working with their team allows for me to offer that kind of traditional support to artists. And then in terms of just what I offer as well, kind of, which is my own creation on top of the, that kind of nuts and bolts is I really like to offer the sense of midwifing the music into the world. And what I mean by that is often emotionally and kind of energetically, when we go to release something, there's this process of, can I really do this? Or, you know, is this good enough? Or am I ready? Or all of these things that can get in our way internally. And so I like to just help artists hold space for that stuff to kind of be like, yes, you are, or whatever it is that they need to break through in order to come to a place of just celebrating their release because mm -hmm. it's really hard when you have something beautiful that you've put so much work into and then you release it, but you're not feeling a hundred percent great about it, you know? Yeah. And so I really want to make sure that every artist that I work with feels like in control of their choices, like they've thought about all the options and even know what to, you know, focus on as they're making their choices. And then from there be like solid my release is out in the world and I feel great you know not mm. like oh I could have gotten that mixed a little better or like gosh should I take it down or whatever you know like that kind of thing so do you help them with the the front end stuff as far as the production that's a really great question I do have an option for my artists to work with me as a producer um, you know, that's sort of another leg of the label that I'm exploring because I do work as a, a producer and, um, actually I teach music production too, mm -hmm. through my, through my mentorship. Um, so what I've, I have done is linked my clients, uh, through to the label side of things. You know, if we've been working together for a while and I've helped them with their vocal production or even produced some music for them, then it's a very seamless transition into releasing through Moonbay Records. 
So usually that's been the way things have been flowing. And again, this is new. So, so far I haven't had people come through the label side into the production realm with me. It's been more, okay, we're working together as a client and then we are releasing. But yeah, that's totally a part of what I can offer, you know, so we'll see. what. Yeah, because I find that a lot of people, they've got their songs, they've written them. They just don't know where to go for good production. You know, it's true, Brie, it's true. And that's why I'm feeling, yeah, like the call to step into that more as a female producer, because mm -hmm. it's, it's needed. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is needed. Yeah. So yeah that's so what about the um the back end stuff like kind of what i like to call like the fan catcher system you know like do you help them set up their website and their email list and their socials and like you know make sure that there are ways to like capitalize on the fact that they're getting this promotion around their release mm, great question you know i don't focus <laughs> i have to say i don't focus on the email list which I'm working personally on, I'm like, I know it's important. I need to focus better on it, but it's not my strong point just to be honest. And, uh, well, that's my strong point. So well, there we go come over here. Yeah. I'm, I'm so like harping on the email list all the time. My community probably is sick of me, but you know what? They're not because they bring it up almost every meeting, you wow. know, that they know they need to be working on it. So like, they know it's important, but yeah, like, it's, it's kind of one of those things, like, as you know, right. I do know. You gotta it, do. Yeah. It's because like the social media aspect is the sparkly kind of like quick endorphin release mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And I get stuck in that too. And then the email list is this deeper, like you said, fan catcher that it's really more reliable, but it's not as like sexy and sparkly and like right. easy <laughs> or like quick. Well, so, and it involves having systems and, exactly. you know, yeah. and, and making sure that you're being consistent and all of that. Whereas on, like you said, social media, you can just like put something out there and get okay. like this immediate gratification. Gratification. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have been pretty good at helping them build their social media planning around the release <laughs> and what to do, how, like how to post consistently and tell your story through the social media posting and like even what to post, like how, why reels are better than, you know, than regular posts and things like mm -hmm. that kind of staying up to date on that kind of end. But in terms of optimizing the whole growth funnel, um, I think that's why there's people who do what I do and people who do what you do and like other people in the world, because we, we can't. It's individually true. I, I'm not going to help them with their production, you know, cause that's right. not my thing, or I'm not going to really go de deep on branding. Cause that's not my thing. We have to have our specializations. That's it. Yeah. So <laughs> well, let me ask this may be a little bit of an uncomfortable question, but Ooh. let me ask, like, how do you choose who you bring on to your label? And like, what if someone comes to you with music that you think you is like, it's just not quite there, you know? Right, right. This is such a good question because I've been sort of secretly questioning that in my own mind. And I'm like, well, first of all, I want to be this inclusive space and this inclusive model. And you know, I want to have a high quality curated experience for listeners and fellow artists and everything. And so I think there's a little bit of a give and take and always a conversation around it for me internally. And I think the most important thing for me is like, have they been, you know, like, is it at a certain level that they've been working on it and it's not their very first thing that they did in garage band or, or anything like right. that. Right. It's like above that quality level and it has an alignment with the brand and the focus and the energy of the brand, which is either like, you know, you're a mother artist who's doing it and you've been kind of doing it. Like it's not your first rodeo, but you are pursuing this like seriously. Um, and, or it's got this kind of indie electronic vibe that is my aesthetic that I've created. So it goes in alignment with that. Mm. So it's, sort of, it's stylistically a fit. So yeah, all of those things. And then honestly, like, are we, do I feel empowered by the relationship with this artist? Are they in it for the right reasons? Do they have integrity as an artist? And can I feel 
do I feel that I can be their number one fan? Mm -hmm. And are they going to like return that sense of, you know, mutual uplifting and empowerment? Because the way I see this label again is like as a community and, and as like a way to mutually empower and cross pollinate and further each other's missions. And so it's really got to be that energetic fit for me in terms of who I'm going to work with. Cause that means I'm going to put time into that person and they're going to, you know, be receiving that from me as well as putting time into the label. And so, you know, it's got to be feel reciprocal and just like positive energy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I agree. Like it is a, it's a give and take relationship and, you know, you both have to be in it and all that. And it's a community, but at the end of the day, this is your brand too. Like you're yeah. putting yourself on the line and you have to, to, like you said, you have to be their number one fan. Yeah. So, you know, eventually you're going to have so many people coming to you that you're going to have to turn people down. Yeah. And you're going to have to get more picky, you know, and, and uh, yeah. that's going to be a hard one, right? It like, is going to be a hard one. <laughs> I, yeah. I hate having to do that too on my women of substance podcast. It's like, I have to sometimes say like, this just isn't there, you know, like right. I want it to be there, but it's and not. And how do you say that in, you know, in the right way? It's, I usually say something like, you know, it doesn't quite you know, fit yeah. our production quality, you know, that's usually the problem. Right. Um, sometimes I actually will say something about the songwriting, like, you know, I can't hear a hook in this song or, mm -hmm. you know, the verses and the choruses sound too much the same or, you know, something like that. Cause we're yeah. talking about individual songs here, but sure. like in, at the end of the day, you're not doing them any service by just not giving them any kind of feedback because they it's need to so know true. why they weren't accepted. And this is a huge, really good point too, because in, I'm like in the shitty version of the music industry, you, you email all these people and nobody gets back to you. Right. And that's a horrible feeling. I would much rather have someone come back to me and say, thank you for submitting. It's not quite, even like what you just said, I can't quite hear a hook here. That would give me something to go work on. Yep. I know. Oh. I was just, I just interviewed um, the founder of Submit Hub yesterday and we were having this conversation, right? And then he's like, we've had to build in all these things like, you know, for feedback and everything. But he's like, you know, some people, they want nice feedback. They don't want the really, you know, gritty, like we're actually going to tell you what your issues are feedback. And so he's like, so now I have to build in something where it's like, you opt in for which kind of feedback you want. Real feedback or right. ego boosting feedback. No, yeah, that's right. That's right. Do you want me no. to be like, you know, true with you or just say like, oh, it's just, it's not my thing, you know? Right. Gosh. Wow. This is, it's really huge. Cause this is really one of the hardest and most important things about being an artist is how you can take, you know, constructive criticism and give it. Cause it's, we, we always have room to grow. I know I have room to grow. And so, yeah, but it's good. Yeah. Question. It is, yeah. And then and it's definitely going to become a thing, I think, down the road that you'll have to be a little bit more picky. But are, are you looking for specific genres? Like you mentioned that electronic kind of vibe, yeah. or are you open to like multi genres? I'm open to multi genres. Um, and I have a focus on what I'm calling femme EDM mm. or embodied electronica. Okay. So it's like this vocal centric kind of electronic, uh, cross pollination. Got it. Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about like, how, how does the financial stuff break down? Because I know that, you know, when you're looking at the major labels, it's generally not at all favorable to the artist, but like you also are thinking, well, that label's got a lot of overhead and they've got a lot of expenses and, and I think the thing that had bothered me the most about label deals is that the artists had no input on what the label was spending their money on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I haven't really spoken to an indie label owner to have that conversation. And since you've kind of looked into indie labels in the past and considered that, I'd be curious to know, like, what did you see in that relationship and that financial relationship in indie labels and, and how are you doing it in your label? 
That's a really good question. And to be honest, that's something that I'm still figuring out, you know, the perfect structure for, and I may be figuring that out for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm committed to basically taking a percentage that supports the artist. And if I am going to be putting their, you know, budget into something, it's a conversation with the artist where they are getting to decide what that is. And what I've seen in the past with indie labels is again, either they take 50% and they don't offer any kind of support other than a Spotify playlist experience. Um, or they, they own the master entirely and I've been bought outright, uh, <laughs> And, and still not done, you know, a full marketing campaign or anything like that. So that's really what I'm clearly steering away from. Other things kind of in the middle that I've seen is uh, an indie label I also signed with for an EP. They took a lesser percentage, but, and they offered me some support around funding the album art, which was kind of this nice intermediate play of like, okay, well, they're not putting... Uh, you know, thousands of dollars behind a PR campaign for me by any means. Um, but they are helping me do the actual nitty gritty of the work of getting of the release out there um, and branding it and all of that. So I'm basically working with the distribution that I have, the distribution deal and um, what they offer and sort of funneling these options um, to my artists. And so it's always a conversation. Um, and then again, what I offer in terms of production as well, if that filters into it, it's kind of this very highly like personalized experience um, between the artist and I. And I think I like it that way because it allows for the most form fitting release plan. Cause I don't think that there's like a one size fits all kind of release deal. And that's why I love being an indie label owners because I can do that because I don't have to like say this for everything and I'll mm -hmm. be all this is what it is this is how it's going to work best for every single artist it's like no maybe this person needs a lot of support with their album art um maybe this person has all that dialed and so they don't need that that's you right know? I mean everybody has like people in their life or maybe they have a bit of a team you know, or yeah. past experiences that they can draw on. And, and exactly. some people are just totally new, totally green, don't know anyone and they need exactly. support in everything. So I think that's a really good model to kind of pick and choose like what they need, like a cafe style kind of model. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Little bistro. Yes. <laughs> Buffet. Yes. So do you get any kind of money up front from them? Because I mean, I, here I am, like, I'm always obviously a sympathetic artist, but I'm also a business owner and I yeah. know that you have costs, right? So just taking a percentage, first of all, that's coming down the road and royalties and it takes a while and all that stuff. Like, what are you, how are you able to have your costs covered from the beginning of the relationship? That's such a great question. And that's one that is sort of this conglomeration of my coaching, honestly, like my coaching business. And if I've worked with them, you know, as a coach and a mentor and or producer, that some of that gets covered there. But then there's also the option of them investing in some PR for themselves that then I help curate for them. Mm. Um, and that, you know, their investment goes to cover that um, as well. And I'm not honestly looking to get rich with this label. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I get it. It's a passion project. It's it a purpose-driven kind of calling for you. Yeah. And I'm not looking to get quote rich with what I'm doing either, but you know, when you have a team and you know, you have payroll, you, totally. know, you have to know that you're covering stuff. Right. Absolutely. And I don't have a team yet. So this might change for me, you know, pretty drastically mm -hmm. pretty soon as well. Um, but for the time being, yeah, I'm, I'm working with it as I can. And I've honestly even thought about like, what, what would somehow a community model look like of even fundraising for similarly to you, how you would like an organization that's doing good in the world. Like, what if I could get 
just like a really nice chunk of a PR budget for all of these artists from people who believe in the model of women and music and, you know, supporting mamas who are putting their music out there and stuff. Um, so I'm playing with different options down the road to get a, a heftier support financially. I also wonder if maybe, you know, each person has kind of their, their special skills and like, they could like donate their skills to the pot. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm good with design and, you know, I'm good with whatever and like donate that to the pot in return for, you know, getting back some value, equivalent value of some other thing that they needed. Yes. <laughs> See, this is what I'm talking about is like, how can we actually, yeah, create a different kind of model for a label? Like, have you ever heard of a label doing that? I haven't yet, but why no, not? No, but it sounds cool, right? It sounds super cool. <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Bree. Do you want to be a part of it? <laughs> well, it, it definitely is like in my wheelhouse, it sounds really cool. And it's like perfect for the demographic that I champion. So yeah, I love it. I love it. You're, you can be the email list specialist. No, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in return, I can get my next single produced. That'd be perfect. I, there we, there kind we of go. At that, so, Hey, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and what about, um, do you guys offer any support for like the performing arm of this whole thing of like getting out there to tour, to promote your releases? Not specifically yet, but there is just, again, the sense of being in the community, kind of being a part of the brand and, and you know, my connections that I have built over the past 10 years in the worlds that I have played live they can definitely come in through those doors oh i see some label showcases coming here because i mean i used to do that for women of substance um a while wow. back when i was in la and we'd you know do a showcase for you know five or six of our artists in one place and that could be a cool thing to do too i love that i love that <laughs> yeah i'm actually doing my first show since becoming a mama pretty soon and it's it's like kind of like a, that that energy. So yeah, that's very like, cool. Yeah. Well, for those who are listening and are thinking about, you know, should I look for an indie label? Should I look into moon babe records? Should I do this on my own? Do you have any advice as far as like what criteria could help them decide what, whether they should look for an indie label or to try to do it on their own? Like, do they need to have a certain level of mm -hmm. skill set or something to try to do it on their own? That's a really great question. I would say, you know, it's actually funny. I would kind of say the opposite. Like, have you ever even like tried <laughs> to release anything on your own yet? If no, then maybe, maybe dabble, like maybe just put some paint on the canvas. And I know that that might be a really uncomfortable notion for people, but I think that you learn a lot that way. And you actually will learn whether or not you want the support <clears throat> of a label, whether that be Moon Babe or another indie label. Um, and you'll know what better to look for in terms of what each different label offers and whether that's really gonna be amenable and supportive to you. Um, Cause I think, I mean, I always say like throwing yourself in the fire is the best way to learn something. So even if you sign up for a month of DistroKid and you just, put one thing out there. If you haven't put anything out before, um, you're going to be in a better position to then say, yeah, hi, I'd like to sign with you. I'd like to release. And you're going to bring more to the table as an artist who at least, you know, has a name on Spotify, for example, you're not creating a brand new artist name because there's a lot just in and of that, um, that I think is important to to empower yourself to lay the foundation for, because you don't from the get-go want to be running to somebody else to kind of figure out these, these things for you. I think that what I want is to at least have this partnership model where it's like, I'm supporting this artist who, again, is obviously already really invested, you know, in their career and they're willing to do the thing themselves to get to like, figure it out, but they can benefit from what I have to offer. 
Does that make sense? No, that makes complete sense to me. And that's exactly the approach that I like to take because, you know, on, on that same thing, but like on the level of people always asking me, like, I want a manager, it's the same thing. Yeah. Like if yeah. you don't know how to do your own stuff, how are you going to know that this person that yes. you're hiring and paying is doing a good job? 1000%. <laughs> and yeah, I agree. Like just getting that kind of digital footprint as an artist yeah. of, of figuring out like, you know, what it's like to be mm-hmm. on Spotify. And, and like you said, like working with DistroKid and do you like that experience or do you feel like you really need support there? Um, right. But I do get a lot of pushback on that from people because they're just like, I don't have time or this is too techie for me. I can't do it myself. And, you know, and I get that, but like you said, we are going to learn so much by doing that thing. That's uncomfortable. You're going to up level yourself as an artist, as an entrepreneur, and you're going to be a much better contributor, not only to your own career, but to this collective that you would join if you join an indie label. That's right. Yep. And it takes like a lot of patience anyway, to be an independent artist. So if you're not comfortable with that notion, then, you know, maybe that's something you've got to work on a little bit. Um, cause things don't come overnight in this career. Right. And yep. you really have to be willing to take every tiny step and, and celebrate it, celebrate the really little wins, because in my experience, that's what growing a successful independent music career consists of is like, so many little, little steps and fail, failures too. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, spoken like a true, uh, artist who's been through the fire for sure. You, <laughs> you know what it's like. And I, I totally agree. So if, um, our listeners want to reach out to you and find out more about you and about moon babe records, where should they go? Give them all the uh, links. Okay. So right now, the best way to reach out is through my coaching uh, email, which is hello at mindbodymusic.co. And then you can also visit um, mindbodymusic.co slash moonbabe records. So again, mindbodymusic.co slash moonbabe records to find out more and sign up for the mailing list and all that. And are you on socials too? Yeah. Um, Instagram, moonbabe records, Facebook's moonbabe records. And then if you want to just find out more about me and my music, I'm Heather Christie with a C-H. So C-H-R-I-S-T-I-E. And you can find me on Spotify. You can find Moonbabe Records on Spotify as well. Please follow us and uh, follow all of our playlists. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much. This has been such a cool conversation. I really appreciate you bringing all your expertise to this. Thank you, Brie. Thanks for asking all the uncomfortable and exciting questions. And- Of course. That's what I love doing. (laughs) Yeah. It's great. It's been great. Yeah. Really good to chat with you. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.